Thank you all one for joining us for another brown bag. Uh, my name is Jeremy. I'm the museum services manager for the Sandusky Library and Fallout House Museum. And I uh, want to thank you all for coming for another digital brown bag. Uh, I will just take a moment to talk about next month's brown bag. Uh, next month's brown bag will be on World War II prisoner war camps in Ohio. Uh, now, one of the unique things about that program compared to what we've been doing for the last year is you will be able to attend that event in person here at the library. Um, now, seating will be limited for that for that program due to uh, co the uh, we want to promote social distancing, of course, with the way COVID's going right now. Um, and you will be required to wear a mask during the event uh, when you're in the program room. Uh, but that will be an in-person program, so we hope to see some of you there. But today, of course, we have a wonderful program on Native Americans of Northern Ohio, and I'm going to turn uh, this over to our speaker for today, uh, Dr. David Nichols, and I'll let him introduce himself because he'll do a much better job of it than I will. Um, I am going to turn my camera off and mute myself, but I will still be here. Well, thank you, Jeremy. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, today, and my thanks to as well to the indigenous peoples of Northern Ohio in whose homeland we are physically and virtually gathered uh, for today's program. Uh, I am the Carmody Chair in History at Indiana University Bloomington, uh, a professor of Native American and Indigenous Studies at IU Bloomington, and also the editor of the Indiana Magazine of History. Uh, but I will try not to let my Hoosier chauvinism uh, as much, at least, into today's presentation. Um, the title of today's program, uh, Inland Sea, is drawn from the title of my most recent book, Peoples of the Inland Sea, which was published in 2018 by Ohio University Press, uh, which is a study of the history of Native Americans and their European and white American neighbors and sometime antagonists from about 1600 CE to the end of the 19th century. I thought for today's presentation and to avoid taking up more than uh, the hour allotted uh, and to appeal more to the particular interests of our audience, I would focus on Native Americans in Northern Ohio or the Southern shorelands of Lake Erie, if you prefer, uh, and we'll shift to my PowerPoint presentation uh, at this point, I hope hope that that works. So, should be able to swing back to that. Yes. All right. So, go to slideshow. So today we will be focusing primarily on the uh, 18th and 19th centuries of the Common Era. Uh, but I do want to talk a little bit about the uh, pre-colonial period and also the 20th century. So the subtitle of my presentation today is The Last Thousand Years. And we might also add, uh, add a hint about where the next thousand might go. And certainly uh, that's a subject we can talk about too during questions and answers. Indigenous Americans arrived in the Great Lakes region, uh, as many of you probably know, at least 10,000 years BCE, uh, probably sooner, probably as soon as the uh, Laurentian ice sheet began to retreat sufficiently to make it possible for humans to live in the region and to feed themselves. On the southern shores of Lake Erie, the last or the uh, most, uh, one might say, regionally typical or regionally uh, particular culture to evolve in, to develop in the pre-Columbian period is referred to by archaeologists as the Sandusky tradition. Uh, Northern Ohio was kind of at the periphery of the uh, Adena and Hopewell and Mississippi and mound builder cultures uh, that are perhaps best known to archaeologists and to those with an interest in pre-contact Native American history. Uh, but the Sandusky tradition uh, 
uh, which was is the name given to the a particular culture uh, was definitely unique to the area, although it probably had some features in common uh, with those of native groups living in the vicinity of modern Detroit uh, and with the Eries living in what is now northwestern Pennsylvania and northeastern Ohio. Sandusky tradition Indians uh, resided in villages. I was about to say fixed villages, but there's evidence that like the Six Nations Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, residing in modern upstate New York, that they abandoned villages, particular villages once a set number of years had passed, uh, possibly once the local cornfields had lost most of their nutrients, lost most of their nitrogen, and moved to other village sites nearby and then repeated this process and continued the cycle within a particular region. In this case, the river, uh, rivers and, and creeks to the southwest of Sandusky Bay. Archaeologists date this tradition to approximately 1000 CE, that is to say about 1000 years ago, perhaps a bit sooner, all the way up until the 17th century. Like Native Americans elsewhere in North America or in, in those parts of North America where there was high enough summer temperatures and sufficient rainfall to allow it, the Sandusky tradition uh, communities lived on a combination of hunting, fishing, and the cultivation of maize, uh, a northern variety of which, or a uh, quick growing variety of which that only required about 100 frost-free days uh, to mature, had been developed by Native North Americans by around five or 600 CE, that is to say about the sixth or seventh century of the common era. So native peoples in Northern Ohio, like those of the Sandusky tradition, were able to get most of their calories from growing maize and beans uh, and the rest, as well as much of their protein uh, from hunting game animals and from fishing. They left behind them too, shell-tempered ceramics, which were likely used to hold a food surplus. Uh, the pot seen here on the right is a, um, I believe, a uh, Maskutin uh, ceramic pot from present-day uh, Wisconsin, or from the Maskutin people of present-day Wisconsin. Uh, and this is an example of what the completed ceramics of the Sandusky tradition people uh, probably looked like. We, we only have pot sherds at the moment uh, to typify the, that part of that culture. Round about 1300 CE, the Sandusky tradition settlements begin to show signs of fortification, uh, which may indicate a desire to keep out wild animals. It may indicate a desire to protect their communities from others uh, for, who wished to raid them uh, for food or more likely for captives. And it may point to an increase in the overall human population south of Lake Erie. <clears throat> the archeologists who excavated the sites of the Sandusky tradition believe that based on the remains and the artifacts they left behind, they probably bore a very strong resemblance to or were uh, the fire nation identified by early Jesuit uh, and French official documents as residing on the south shore of Lake Erie around 1600 CE. The Fire Nation was driven west in the mid 1600s by Iroquoian peoples, uh, including the Erie and probably also including the Haudenosaunee, which is the eponym of the Six Nations Iroquois, then of course the Five Nations Iroquois, but I'll refer to them as Six Nations uh, today uh, to avoid additional confusion uh, in the 1640s and 50s. And it is likely that that fire nation uh, moving west settled in present day Wisconsin and Northern Illinois and became the direct ancestors of the Maskutem people who also refer to themselves as the nation of fire or the fire people. So there is likely a lineal connection between the Sandusky tradition of a thousand years ago and the modern Maskutem people uh, of uh, Wisconsin. The other prime, the the other uh, Indian nation residing on Lake Erie, which has a definite 
uh, connection not only to the pre-Columbian but the historic era, era were the Eries, who were, according to the Jesuits, speakers of a language similar to that of the Six Nations uh, and residents of fortified towns like those of the Six Nations Iroquois. The Eries were defeated and dispersed by the Iroquois in a series of wars from about 1655 to 58. The Six Nations Iroquois, or Haudenosaunee, had uh, greater numbers and also more firearms than the Eries had access to, uh, and also had developed military tactics for storming fortified towns in the absence of artillery, which for the most part, Native Americans were unable to gain access to in the 17th century. The Eries, some of them were adopted forcibly or otherwise by the Six Nations Iroquois. Others relocated southward uh, and Native Americans, we should note, in the proto-historic and pre-historic, that is to say, pre-written document era or pre-European contact era, didn't just sit in their communities and wait to be discovered. They traveled and had trading connections with one another. Uh, the Eries most likely had trading connections or military conflicts with Native people living to the south of them. And this is likely what uh, caused them to decide to move southward through Western Pennsylvania uh, into what is now far southwestern Virginia around the end of the 1650s. There they became the uh, ancestors or the, they had their names changed by the English to the Westos, who became one of the primary slave raiding uh, entities in Western Virginia and in the Western Carolinas uh, during the second half of the 17th century. So the Eries uh, were not exactly dispersed so much as they were forced to relocate uh, and to change their tribal name. By the end of the 1600s, though, the south shore of Lake Erie was, if not entirely depopulated, then at least suffering from a period of very limited human habitation, uh, and limited habitation by indigenous Americans. Uh, this would happen again, though for different re for slightly different reasons, during the 19th and early 20th centuries, as we shall see. The early 18th century did see a brief uptick in the indigenous population of the southwestern shorelands of Lake Erie, when the Crane Band, that is to say, the largest band of the group of Indian bands that would become the Miami Nation were obliged by local internecine conflict to relocate south from the new French outpost of Detroit into the Black Swamp region around the Maumee River. And as some of you probably, if not most of you probably know, the Black Swamp was the primary uh, geological feature or geomorphological feature of Northwestern Ohio until the middle of the 19th century. It was a region of marshes uh, and of uh, wetlands and ponds and generally uh, waterlogged ground uh, surrounding a river that I believe even today uh, is relatively sluggish and has a relatively low elevation, that is to say the Maumee. And Native Americans, far from seeing the Black Swamp as being an obstruction to progress, viewed it as a very important and rich source of food, of fish, of course, of waterfowl, and of game animals. Native peoples uh, in the 18th century, particularly the Miamis, but also increasingly by the end of the century, the Ottawas, uh, established their communities around the Black Swamp so that they could while not living exactly within the swampland itself, could take advantage of its rich food sources. The Miami Indians, or the Crane Band rather, temporarily took refuge within the Black Swamp itself in order to avoid an armed conflict with French officials who were trying essentially to arrest or kill them uh, for being involved in a fight with other native peoples around Detroit. Uh, the band in question, the Crane Band, eventually relocated to the upper Wabash River Valley, though likely continued to use the Black Swamp uh, as a hunting, fishing, and fowling domain. We know about this Miami group thanks to 
the decision of recollect missionaries from Detroit to establish what turned out a short-lived but recorded mission for them during uh, the period of their residence, the mission of Saint Antoine du Padou au Miami uh, and what, is, uh, what we've now been able to identify as the Maumee River. And the Indiana Magazine is hoping to publish some scholarship on this Miami sojourn uh, sometime in 2022 or 23. During the 1730s, other native groups uh, which either had had a falling out with the French or who simply wanted to take advantage of uh, the Lake Erie shorelands resources and its growing proximity to English traders operating out of Pennsylvania, relocated to the former homeland of the Fire Nation and the Eries. In 1737 and 38, the Huron Wendat people who had been dispersed by the Six Nations Iroquois, the Haudenosaunee, in the 1650s uh, and had relocated to multiple places on the upper Great Lakes, a large number of them resettled on the Sandusky River, both near Sandusky Bay and on the river itself. Uh, this nation is known today primarily as the Wyandots. In Canada, they are known and often they refer to themselves as the Wendat people. Uh, they are also sometimes referred to as the Hurons. They're all the same group for the most part, though the, 16th, the 17th century Hurons did intermarry to some extent with other Iroquoian speaking peoples also dispersed by the Haudenosaunee or Six Nations Iroquois. Uh, so uh, genetically uh, and in terms of familial descent, the modern Wyandots are slightly different from the 17th century Hurons, but in terms of language and culture, they're, they're largely similar. The Wendats would remain in the Sandusky Valley for over a century, as we shall see. After the, during and after the Seven Years' War between the French and the British, Ottawa's from present-day Michigan settled in the Maumee River Valley, again to take advantage of the rich food resources of the Black Swamp region, uh, and also to take advantage of the growing availability of trade with the English operating out of Pennsylvania, traders like George, the Irishman George Crowan and others. And at around the same time, Delawares from Western Pennsylvania who had been essentially either uh, strongly encouraged or actually forced to relocate to Western Pennsylvania uh, by that colony's proprietors, uh, some of them resettled on the Cuyahoga River near present day Cleveland. The shorelands between these centers of settlement were used in common by the Delawares or Lenape's and Muncie's, uh, by the Wendats and by the Ottawa's. Uh, these different groups uh, hunted uh, along the Lake Erie shorelands. Uh, they fished and used Lake Erie itself as a, an avenue of travel. Uh, it is more than likely that they shared campfires with one another, and it is almost certain that they shared stories with one another. The historian Gregory Evans Dowd, uh, in his 2002 study of Pontiac's War, uh, argued, and I think I think this is the this is this is the likeliest scenario, that it is in this region, it is in these shared hunting and fishing camps, that the Delawares first shared with the Ottawa people the story of the prophet Neolin, who was one of a number of prophetic figures in the mid. 18th century to argue that native peoples needed to ally with one another and fight against the contamination of their culture by European artifacts and the contamination of their lands by European soldiers, particularly British soldiers and settlers. So while the Lake Erie shorelands were not a major battleground, though there, there was a, at least one significant military action there, a Pontiac's war, this is the region that essentially served as the conduit for the ideas that became the ideological underpinning of Pontiac's war in the 1760s. The illustration here, by the way, is a watercolor, 19th century, I, I believe, of an Ottawa summer um, temporary village, a fishing camp, as you can see, uh, and, and likely hunting camp. The Ottawa's also maintained sturdier winter settlements uh, during that time of the year. The word Ottawa, by the way, means traveler, and the Ottawas themselves acquired a reputation for traveling hundreds of miles 
uh, to trade, uh, intermarry, and sometimes make warfare on other peoples. The Ottawas uh, were also, we might know, part of a larger group of native peoples who refer to themselves today as the Anishinaabeg, and include among them the Ottawas, the Ojibwas of the modern Upper Great Lakes and Southern Ontario, uh, or uh, I should say Southwestern Ontario, uh, and the Potawatomis who reside in a number of reservations and communities pretty much all around the uh, eastern and near western United, uh, northeastern and near western United States and parts of Canada. Uh, I've mentioned the Delaware's and Wyandotte's origins. Uh, it is fair to say that these are all peoples who were not resident one way or the other uh, in the Lake Erie shorelands in 1600, but had been resident there for centuries by the time of Indian removal. As I mentioned, the Indians of Northern Ohio, the Ottawa's, Delaware's, Wendat's, and others, were nominally French allies and nominally under French rule for much of the 18th century, the 1730s, 40s, 50s. Uh, but that was a very nominal allegiance. Indeed, the, Wendats, the Wyandots and the Delawares had moved there in part because they wanted to place themselves equidistant from the French trading and administrative center at Detroit and the and British traders operating out of the Susquehanna Valley in Pennsylvania. By the late 1740s, at least one of these traders, the Irishman George Crowan, uh, had a temporary trading post on the Cuyahoga River, uh, which lasted from about 1745 to about 1750. Uh, and the British would maintain other trading posts further west on the Lake Erie shorelands later in the 18th century. Native Americans in Northern Ohio were happy to have the English or the British, I should say, come among them to trade. Not so happy to have British soldiers take up posts uh, in regions that had once allegedly been French territory. They very much, Native Americans, saw the Lake Erie shorelands as native ground, as their collective homeland, as a region that they could share resources with, uh, with other peoples. Uh, but where their homes, where their villages, where their fields, where their ancestors' graves were located and which were therefore their lands. When British soldiers set up a post at Sandusky after the Seven Years' War, it generated a great deal of discontent from the Wendat people nearby who uh, destroyed that post early in Pontiac's War in the spring of 1763. Uh, Pontiac's War ended more or less, as many of you know, with a draw uh, of sorts between the British and the Native American insurgents who had destroyed most of Britain's forts in the Great Lakes region after the French and Indian War. Uh, the Native peoples who took part in Pontiac's movement, to the extent Pontiac was the single leader of this movement, which he wasn't, uh, were unable to destroy all of Britain's fortified towns in the Great Lakes region. Uh, the British, however, were not able to inflict a decisive military blow on any Native American community or Native American nation during that conflict. So both sides essentially agreed to simply sign peace treaties, uh, return as many uh, captive British uh, women and men and children as their native relatives were willing to, or new relatives were willing to give up uh, and to resume peaceful relations uh, with, uh, with, without further delay. By the 1770s, native peoples in Northern Ohio had become British trading partners as many of them had been in the 1740s and 50s. And during the war for American independence, uh, many young men in the region, drawn by the possibility of obtaining glory and plunder for the captives, the latter two being important resources for people who sometimes lived close to the subsistence line, agreed to become military allies of Great Britain. Hundreds of warriors from the northern, uh, from the region from northern Ohio, from Sandusky, and from the Ottawa communities in the Maumee Valley, and from the, the Delawares in northeastern Ohio. Uh, became military uh, auxiliaries, or I should say, uh, military allies of the British Army, taking part in raids against uh, against uh, the rebels and against their settlements. Two 
Native American war leaders in the region became uh, prominent and uh, in the conflict and indeed rather infamous to the rebels, the future, you know, that is to say the future United States. Captain Pipe of uh, the Delawares seen here in a statue uh, from the 20th century uh, and the half king or uh, that's a translation of the French term viceroy of the Wendats, uh, both of whom were viewed as being formidable adversaries by the, United, by the United States even after the end of the war for American independence. During the late 70s and early 1780s, rebel militia forces destroyed and the Continental Army destroyed a number of Indian towns in Southern Ohio, uh, most infamously the Moravian Delaware towns at Gnadenhut and Salem, uh, but their one significant attempt of the Continental Army to attack a prominent native community in Northern Ohio famously failed. Uh, the officer William Crawford, a friend of George Washington, uh, was unable to successfully lead a military raid against Sandusky in 1782. And indeed he was captured and tortured to death uh, by the Wendats and their allies in partial retaliation for the murder of the Moravian Delawares at Nottenhutum a few months earlier. The Revolutionary War in the Ohio country, as I've argued elsewhere in my book, Red Gentlemen and White Savages, uh, did not end in 1782. The British government agreed to sign a peace treaty and recognize the independence and sovereignty of the United States in 1783 but it did not invite its Indian allies to the bargaining table, and therefore they did not feel themselves bound by the terms of that treaty. After a period of peace, or more precisely a period of armistice, during which the United States attempt, sent commissioners to try to bully Native Americans in the Ohio country into surrendering their lands without a fight, Native warriors in Northern and Southern Ohio, and indeed throughout the region, Resumed, their, uh, resumed a hit and run war against the United States and particularly against the large numbers of white settlers uh, moving into the Ohio Valley, uh, primarily to settle in Kentucky and in Tennessee. From beginning in 1786 and continuing until 1794, Delawares, Wyandots, Ottawas, uh, Potawatomis, Miamis and others uh, took part in a united, though not always coordinated, military campaign against white American settlers, against their flatboats, against their farms, and eventually against the soldiers of the new United States who were set to attack them and destroy their towns in 1790 and 1791. The, some of the native warriors or native peoples or native men, I should say, of Northern Ohio tried to stay out of the conflict uh, until about 1790 or so. But once they learned that the new United States was sending armies to uh, attack what the US believed was the headquarters of this new Native American Confederacy uh, on the Wabash River at what is now Fort Wayne, uh, warriors of the Northern Ohio Delawares and Wyandots and Ottawa's began to join in this Confederacy of warriors uh, in the early 1790s. The United States uh, interspersed its unsuccessful military campaigns with equally unsuccessful attempts at diplomatic negotiation with Native American men who increasingly identified themselves as the United Indians, a new Native American Confederacy uh, with some of the features of a confederated government. Uh, one of the most infamous of these failed negotiations was at a Board of Peace Council that was supposed to take place at Sandusky in 1793, uh, but which was largely sabotaged by or was undermined by the American commissioner's insistence that Native Americans give up at least some of their lands in what is now the state of Ohio to the United States. And Native leaders' uh, response, and the response included uh, a speech that was written by, among others, uh, leaders of the Ohio Delawares and Wyandots. Native leaders, United Indian leaders in response, said that the U.S. should use any money it would be promising Indians in Ohio uh, to evacuate, to give up their lands, to instead evacuate its own white settlers uh, from the new and now legal settlements north 
or ostensibly legal settlements north of the Ohio River. It was the failure of that peace council that inspired the United States to begin one final uh, well-organized, well-armed push against the United Indians. Uh, the uh, advance of the American Legion of the United States under General Anthony Wayne, who successfully de uh, defeated a force of United Indian warriors at the Battle of Fallen Timbers, seen in this 20th century illustration uh, in August of 1794. Fallen Timbers being a place of fallen trees located uh, near present-day Toledo, Ohio. This defeat led uh, pretty much directly to a peace treaty in which the United Indians agreed they would cede uh, the majority of the modern state of Ohio to the United States, including the territory that, would become, that was incorporated in the land grant uh, by Congress uh, and before Congress by uh, the British royal government uh, to the Connecticut Western or the, the uh, Connecticut Western Reserve Company. In 1796, that company opened the first major uh, white American settlement within modern northern Ohio at Cleveland on, on near the Cuyahoga River. Uh, although there was an earlier white American settlement opened a few years earlier at Presqu'ile, modern Erie, Pennsylvania uh, in 1794. The United States government put some effort into trying to shore up its uh, both set white settler and military presence on the north shore of Lake Erie. In 1805, American commissioners concluded with Wendot and Ottawa and other native leaders the Treaty of Fort Industry, under which it procured, the U.S. procured from Native American chiefs the Indian lands of north central Ohio, roughly speaking, the region between the Connecticut Western Reserve and Sandusky Bay. Around the same time, the U.S. government, in an effort to try to win or to uh, draw Wendot and Ottawa men and women away from their commercial reliance from the British in Canada at Fort, at Fort Malden and, and Amherstburg in Canada, uh, established a trading post at Sandusky, a trading factory as it was known at the time, uh, to sell uh, vitally needed goods to Native American hunters and fishermen in exchange uh, for their furs. Uh, from the limited records of that trading factory, we learn that the predominantly Wendat customers of the Sandusky trading factory were not as much interested in buying gunpowder and blankets and other staples of the Indian trade as they were in purchasing such things uh, as fine clothing, uh, stovepipes for their houses, and uh, woodworking tools and ice skates. And the factor, the uh, trading factor who ran the Sandusky trading post, uh, wrote to his superiors uh, that the Wendats were a large, by now a largely uh, an agricultural people, or at least one that were far more sophisticated in their life ways than the United States government had been led uh, to expect. Uh, this didn't stop officials in the War Department from regarding uh, Wendats and other Native Americans as nomadic hunters, but it does remind modern historians uh, that we should avoid stereotype views of Native American lifeways uh, when thinking about Native Americans uh, both in peace and in war during the 18th and 19th centuries. There was a considerable amount of discontent among Indian men, particularly, and women too, to some extent, in the northern Ohio country or in, in the northern part of the state, what is now the state of Ohio, over the United States' desire to acquire Indian land, uh, over the United States' desire in some cases to encourage Native American men to give up hunting in, in favor of farming, although there were Native American communities where men were already doing or doing both or were at least both hunting and raising livestock and the United States' apparent favoritism toward a small number of civil chiefs who received the bulk of the annuities paid out in exchange for previous land sessions. During the end of the first decade and the beginning of the second decade of the 19th century, this discontent led some warriors uh, or some uh, men from northern Ohio communities to align themselves 
with a new pan-Indian movement, an insurgent movement led by the Shawnee prophet Tenskwatawa and his brother Tecumseh. And while Tenskwatawa and Tecumseh were Shawnees, most of the Shawnees uh, themselves were not terribly interested in joining their movement. Most of Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa's followers were actually from other Indian nations. So this was somewhat on brand for them. Their headquarters of, Prophet, of Prophetstown, uh, a war, uh, which lives later to become quite famous as the, uh, the community nearest the Battle of Tippecanoe, was located in land donated by the Potawatomis, for example. When war broke out between the United States and Great Britain in 1812, many Native, people, Native men in northern Ohio chose to side either with Tecumseh's uh, movement or with Great Britain. Uh, since many of them were longtime British trading partners or had joined Tecumseh's movement out of frustration with the U.S. government and their own chiefs. And some of these men took part in uh, the campaign, Tecumseh and the British campaign against American forts in present day uh, Indiana and Ohio. In 1813, Tecumseh, with some help from his British allies, and this included British artillerists, undertook two sieges of a new American fort established on the Maumee River, Fort Meigs, in the spring and summer of 1813. Fort Meigs, however, turned out to be relatively well built. Its designer had been trained at the new American Military Academy at West Point, and despite laying siege to Fort Meigs with 2,500 warriors, a force much larger than the United Indians had ever been able to field two decades earlier, Tecumseh uh, and his fellow war captains were unable to reduce uh, the fort's occupants to surrender before they were able to bring reinforcements up the Wabash River and then down the Maumee by way of the American fort at Fort Wayne. The United States, uh, militarily and other, militarily at least, had come to the region to stay. And a few months after the last siege of Fort Meigs was lifted, the Battle of Put-in Bay, uh, or Battle of Lake Erie, if you prefer, cleared the way for the Americans to move several thousand soldiers northward to retake Fort Detroit from the British, pursue Tecumseh and his followers into Ontario, and to defeat and kill them at the Battle of Moravian Town. This was a decisive and it turned out final blow uh, for the last major pan-Indian movement, uh, military movement in the Great Lakes region. After the War of 1812, the United States government devoted itself to Native American land procurement and removal. In 1817, federal commissioners bought nearly all of the remaining Indian lands in Northwest Ohio, except for a small number of town-sized tracts uh, awarded or allotted to the Shawnees, uh, Ottawas, and Wendats. During the 1830s, the administration of Andrew Jackson uh, Put, put pressure on the remaining Ottawa communities in the Maumee Valley to move to present-day Kansas. Some agreed to do so in 1833 and the rest in 1837. The Wendats, being a somewhat larger and at least initially more cohesive group in their settlements around Sandusky, were able to hold out until 1843. But the United States government pursued a divide and conquer strategy, encouraging those Wendats who were not uh, converts to either Protestant or Catholic Christianity to form their own so-called pagan party and bringing them to Washington, D.C. to persuade them to sign a removal treaty, a tactic used also uh, with the Seminole Indians a few uh, years earlier. Ultimately, Wendat leaders agreed, particularly after one of the starchest opponents of removal was killed under suspicious circumstances in 1841, to sign a removal treaty and to move by foot and by steamboat to Kansas in the mid 1840s. About one sixth of the Wendats, for it, uh, by the way, either died during removal or shortly thereafter due to exposure and illness and lack of food. Uh, this was uh, a deadly process uh, for the Wendats in particular. For a brief period, part of Ohio served as a refuge from Native peoples trying to evade removal. Some of the Miamis who's, who were forced to remove, or at least many of whom were forced to remove in 1846, were able to evade capture and deportation by hiding in the Black Swamp region, which had provided refuge to their ancestors in the early 1700s. 
And some of the Ottawa's from north east, northwestern Ohio uh, likely joined the Potawatomis and some of the, uh, the Ottawa's from Michigan in relocating to British Canada, a region into which American forces who had already nearly lost one war with Britain in 1812 to 14 and didn't wish to prosecute another one, were unwilling to pursue them. Today, there is still an Ottawa and Potawatomi reserve on Walpole Island, located in southwestern Ontario, south of present day uh, Detroit. So there is still at least one Native American community uh, relatively close to present day Ohio that includes very likely descendants of uh, Native residents of Northern Ohio. During the late 19th and early 20th centuries, the landscape of Northern Ohio, of the Southern Lake Erie shorelands was transformed by, uh, the, by colonization by white Americans. Native uh, white farmers and engineers drained the black swamp during the second half of the 19th century for farmland by using uh, clay tile lined ditches in order to sluice off what they considered the surplus water. By the 1880s, there were at least 80 uh, factories in Northern Ohio producing clay tiles, among other clay goods, specifically for purposes of lining these drainage ditches and making sure that the black swamp could be converted from a source of, of game and fish uh, into fertile farmland for commercial and later industrial uh, gauge farming. The settlements or white settlements of Toledo and Cleveland became industrial cities quite famously so in the case of Cleveland, uh, which became, which became uh, somewhat infamous as a source of industrial production as well as industrial pollution in the late 1960s. More on that in a moment. Toledo and Cleveland's uh, industrial job opportunities, however, became attractive to some Native Americans, not necessarily Wendats or Ottawa's or Delaware's, but rather to Lakotas and to Tulalip Indians and to Pueblo Indians from New Mexico in the middle part of the 20th century. There was a very small Native American population in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County or the Cuyahoga River region uh, for much of the second quarter of the, of the 20th century, predominantly Native peoples coming from the Western United States to look for work. And that ticked up to several hundred Native people coming to Toledo and Cleveland during the Second World War to look for work in war industries, a time when about 40 or 50,000 Native Americans moved to American cities uh, to uh, undertake war work. The United States government, and particularly its Commissioner of Indian Affairs in the 1950s, uh, believed that strongly encouraging Native people to move to cities would be an excellent way to end their cultural distinctiveness and their dependence on the United States government for annuities and other payments, many of which they uh, were owed under 19th century treaties, but the United States government has often had a uh, dismissive attitude toward those, toward those sovereign agreements. But that moving, encouraging Native peoples to move to cities would be a good way to assimilate them into the general American population uh, and to end their Indianness, to essentially eliminate uh, this culturally distinct group of Americans uh, and to end the United States uh, aid to them. And so in 1952, the Commissioner of Indian Affairs with approval from Congress began the Indian Relocation Program, providing Native Americans, chiefly in the Western United States with one-way bus tickets uh, and a little relocation assistance to move to American industrial cities and look for work. And during the 1950s, Cleveland became one of the principal relocation centers for native people from the Western United States who, and this was a voluntary program, uh, but who were strongly encouraged by their reservation agents to go to the big city and make something of themselves. And by the year 2000, about 5,000 Indians, mostly from the Western United States, uh, had made their homes at one time or another in Cleveland. They came, however, not necessarily to assimilate, but rather to look for work and hopefully to be able to send money back home to their friends and family on their reservations. By the late 1960s, as Native American identity became more and more a source of 
pride and the defense of Native American sovereignty and distinctiveness became more and more a desirable goal for Native Americans living both in reservations and in the cities, Native peoples in Cleveland began to try to set up their own cultural institutions uh, like the Cleveland uh, Indian uh, Community Center set up in 1969 and to play their own particular role uh, in defining the city's identity. Which brings me to the final story I want to close with today, which is that in 1971, Cleveland was planning to celebrate its 175th anniversary. And the organizers of a pageant that was intended to celebrate uh, Moses Cleveland, the founder of the eponymous city, invited some of the native peoples, most of whom were, as I mentioned, from the Western United States, to dress up as Plains Indian, as, as stereotypical 19th century Plains Indian warriors, and to take part in the pageant, essentially to represent the handing off of uh, the land around Cleveland from its indigenous inhabitants uh, to this presumably better population founding the modern city in, 19, in, in 1796. <laughs> Russell Means, a member of the American Indian movement, uh, seen here on the left, uh, on the far left of the photo, uh, came to Cleveland to help set up the community center and afterwards to take part uh, in demonstrations intended to show Native Americans' determination to take pride in their heritage uh, and in their political, political sovereignty. Uh, Means asked to help organize a group of Indian people to come and essentially uh, pretend to be a dying race so that they could celebrate whites taking over the region, said, oh yes, we'll be there. And as you see from the signs that the uh, assembled invitees slash protesters are holding, they were there and were perfectly happy to point out that perhaps in the 175 years since whites first came to Cleveland and established this first prominent uh, white settlement in Northern Ohio, they had not necessarily, uh, they, had, they had not necessarily turned the region uh, into a paradise on earth, uh, though we might uh, disagree as to whether or not that has changed uh, in the last 50 years. Since this photo was taken. Uh, but if there is another thousand years of Native American history to be written in Northern Ohio, uh, it likely begins with this return, this, this resettlement of Northern Ohio by Native peoples drawn by first industrial work and then the possibility of pan-Indian organization uh, after a period of relative depop of, of what Indigenous Americans would see as depopulation akin to that at the end of the 17th century. That is to say, we are living through a cycle of, uh, a cycle of renewal uh, rather, than what, uh, rather than a very temporary uh, and recent uptick. That's uh, what I have for my presentation today, but I noticed that we're getting close to one o'clock, so I'd like to set some time aside to take questions from the audience uh, and to stop my PowerPoint herewith. Thank you. And yeah, if you have any questions, uh, feel free either to put them in the chat box or to unmute yourself to ask your question. Can we start now? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Mr. Nichols, for appearing. You've answered a whole lot of questions that I've had over the years. Uh, that fascinates me, especially our history. Um, but living in Sandusky, um, we're a boat owner and we uh, took several treks out to the sandbar, and I'm not sure if you would know where that's located, but it's uh, the southern part of Marblehead Peninsula mm -hmm. and uh, into Sandusky Bay and then Cedar Point on the east side. But while we've been out there at the sandbar, and of course that's always um, changing with levels of the water, um, notable bones were washing up out there. And I know well, a friend of ours, actually gathered a couple, took them to one of the archeologists, I'm not sure what city or what university, but um, they stated that they were probably, just by the looks of it, around six to 700 years old. Mm. And because they were, uh, they appeared almost to be wooden and, um, they, but they were obviously, I'm a nurse and I, I, I could see that they were, they were bones, but that's how old they were. And I, always wondered what group of Indians or Native Americans were out in this area. So you answered uh, about the Fire Nation. And I think yeah. because of the age, that would be 
the group. Is that not correct? I think that's right. I mean, I, there, the um, if the bones were to be incorporated into a NAGPRA, a, a Native American Graves Repatriation Act repatriation, uh, it would be up to uh, potential all the potential claimants to come to an agreement as to who had custody. Hmm. My my suggestion would be based on the archaeological work that was done in the eighties and nineties is that there it's likely the that they are mascoutins. They uh, sorry, what, they were what? Ma mascoutin, oh. uh, M A S C O U T E N. Okay. That's that's what that's what the Fire Nation uh, identified by the French in the sixteen hundreds likely became okay. uh, after they were they were dispersed and forced to relocate to Wisconsin and to northern uh, Illinois. But uh, it, it's it's also possible that after a discussion among other potential claimants that one of them may be given custody. But I, I would start by saying it's likely these these were bones belonging to people archaeologists have identified as the Sandusky tradition, which may very well be and and, and likely is the, the the group identified as the Fire Nation by the French in the 17th century and and by as the Mascoutin uh, in the 18th century. Okay. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, and I didn't. I know some of the census data has come out for population did and I I'll admit I didn't look close to it. Did you did they release um uh how the uh, how people identify like if there's been a, a uptick in Native Americans in Ohio, like I don't know if that data is is released now or if that's later. I but like I said I didn't pay that close attention to it. Mm -hmm. I just saw Cities putting out the counties putting out their populations, but I didn't know if they had um, a that type of information involved. Uh, I don't think it is available for 2020, but I haven't checked yet. The yeah. um, the aggregate data are for 2020 have been released because they had to be by law for, in order to in order to start redistricting. Um, yeah. But I don't know. And they may have been released state by state, um, but I'm not sure if if the if the racial data and identifier data have been released state by state. Okay. Uh, aggregate population has to be identified for by state has to be released for redistricting, uh, yeah. for for, for electro electoral purposes. But I don't know if the other data have been released yet. 2010 should be available. Um, yeah. And Cleveland may Cleveland may today may have five thousand people who identify as Native American primarily, and may have more. Uh, the figure I gave up to two thousand is the total number of people who had who had been Native American and had lived in Cleveland, and, and possibly had left thereafter until yeah. two thousand or so. Yeah, I was just curious if that trend had kept going on to the the of the increase. Uh, it may it may have, and I'd I'd also say that. If you look at if you look at population on a county level, that that's likely to have, to have increased, um, because na native people don't always stay in the center city. Yeah. Anyone else have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or put your questions in the chat box. No, I need to. Um, I. Always guilty of, visit, of not visiting historic sites that are close to you. I need to. I haven't. I've been up in this area for almost four years, and I've never made it over to Fort Meigs. I've never made it over to the Battle of Fallen Timbers. You know, I've, it's not. You know, they're both within an hour drive of where I am, and just haven't haven't gone yet. Fort Meigs is pretty. I mean, the battles there are pretty are pretty profound demonstrations of how much U.S. power had grown in just twenty years. Um, because the the number of warriors who invested Fort Meigs during the War of 1812 was was great was twice as great as any body of warriors the United Aid Indians had been able to pull together in the 90s, um, and the Americans still held on. Uh, they were able to bring in over a thousand reinforcements for during the Second Siege, uh, and I think that probably. That plus Tecumseh's death a few months later let let a lot of Lakes Indian warriors who were in Tecumseh's Confederacy or who were British allies know that they they were not fighting a battle they could win. Doesn't doesn't look like anyone else is asking any questions. So um, I'll thank you once again, uh, Dr. Nichols, for joining us. It was a thank pleasure you. having you. We were. Um,
we're always we're glad you uh, were able to talk about this and mentioned your book. And if any of you are interested in in checking out a copy of this book, there is a at least at least one copy because I checked it out um, of Dr. Nichols' book, People of the Inland Seas in the Clevenet system. There's probably more than one, so uh, you can put in. I, don't believe we have a copy here, but I know there's ones at other libraries, so you can feel free to put in a hold and get that if you're interested in learning more about the Native Americans of the Great Lakes. So once again, Dr. Nico, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy, and thanks again, everybody, for coming. I've, I've had a great time.